Uh, Jerome Starkey from The Sun, uh, the defence editor of The Sun, is still with us in the studio. But for now, let's bring in uh, international policy expert and former senior uh, official in the US State Department, Frank Lowenstein. Uh, thanks for joining us, Frank. Uh, first of all, can I ask you, I mean, we're well aware that... Amer I'm not going to talk about the actual situation in the Middle East right now. Uh, broadly, uh, in this country, in Britain, it looks like the people... Uh, and the political echelons are supporting the Prime Minister in uh, joining this strike on Yemen last night. Uh, but we know that in America, Americans are getting rather war-weary about Ukraine. Uh, what's the level of support over in the States among the people for what America and Britain did last night? I think support is very high in the United States for these strikes. So the President went out and explained to the American public why this was imperative and that we were really doing everything we could to prevent this from escalating into a broader regional conflict. So I think for now, public support for, for the Yemen actions are probably very solid. The, the, the Israeli operations in Gaza Strip, that's, a, that's sort of a different story. Frank, I want to ask you about the broader global picture because uh, it's quite clear to people who are sort of very familiar with uh, the machinations of geopolitics that there are all sorts of anti-Western countries uh, quietly behind the scenes joining forces. Um, it strikes me that ships are now being diverted around the southern tip of Africa and in 2023 we saw South Africa on joint naval exercises with none other than Iran, China and Russia. And at the same time, you now have South Africa taking a case against the Israel for genocide to the UN. Should we be alarmed, perhaps, at the role South Africa might wish to play in this? Yeah, well, I think it's part of a bigger problem that the United States has and that all the allies who are supporting Israel in this conflict have, which is that the global South and really probably 70 percent of the world is really on the side of Hamas. In this war, they view Israel as colonizers and somehow or other view the Hamas action is justified. So I think it's a big concern for the Biden administration going forward is how, how are we going to begin to tip the scales back so that the rest of the world sees the validity of what Israel is doing and, and, and isn't sort of siding with Russia and China on this whole issue, which is clearly the case now. And uh, what do you think, uh, Frank, are the chances of the prime minister and the president's hopes and their desire that this conflict does not escalate? Because the Houthis, of course, unexpe oh, uh, unsurprisingly, are vowing revenge, retaliation and punishment. Uh, so uh, are both the president and the prime minister being rather uh, over-optimistic that this conflict will not escalate? Well, I think it depends on how you define escalation. I, I think this is clearly an escalation. I think we really did, and the UK did everything we could to avoid it. We sent numerous warnings there. At, at some point, it became intolerable to allow the Houthis to continue. And if you were really looking to de-escalate, in part, you had to start with deterring the Houthis from further actions along those lines. Uh, uh, that being said, I think the Houthis will respond. I think they'll do everything they can to escalate this conflict with us in the in the Red Sea. I think Iran's hands are, are behind all of this, and they're likely to activate militias in Syria and, and Iraq and Lebanon to try to do as much damage as they can to the United States. But really, when it comes to escalation, the only game changer is the Lebanon border. And as long as Hezbollah is not attacking Israel and as long as we've, we've de-escalated that situation, the concerns about the regional war are, are mitigated significantly. Uh, Frank, from an American perspective, has Biden got this wrong, perhaps, since the start of his tenure, having cut off arms sales to Saudi Arabia uh, in their conflict against Yemen, having removed terrorist designation from the Houthis and having started renegotiating with Iran? Was that being rather short-sighted and naive? Well, I think the approach that the Biden administration has was to try to negotiate uh, as much as we could uh, behind the scenes to avoid exactly the situation we find ourselves in now. And it hadn't been for the war in Gaza. I think we may have succeeded in that. So I don't think the Biden administration was necessarily misguided. I think to some extent they've done everything they can to limit the damage and to limit the possibility for escalation. But to some extent in the Middle East, you know, you can't control events there. And I think we're dealing as best we can with the situation, again, with the same goals in mind, which is to prevent this from really blowing up into a bigger war. Uh, I think it was, uh, it was Obama uh, who first sort of instigated a thawing of relations between the West, America, Britain and Iran. Uh, in retrospect, uh, given what we're seeing now, uh, was that a bit of a historical mistake? Uh, interesting question. I was there with Secretary Kerry when that was all being negotiated. I was the uh, envoy for Middle East peace and a lot of those conversations overlapped. 
And I can tell you the intent there was to resolve the issue of Iran's nuclear program peacefully. And it really, the, the, the Iran nuclear deal would have succeeded in that uh, had the United States stuck with it. I, so I would argue the problem was not negotiating the deal in the first place. The problem was pulling out of it. Because once you pulled out of that deal, first of all, Iran is, is enriching uranium to over 60%, which is a red line we had drawn many, many years ago. They're now weeks away from being able to create enough HEU for a nuclear weapon, which is a, a threshold that was pushed out to a year under the Iran nuclear deal. So once we pulled out of that, we really lost all our leverage with Iran, all our ability to reason with them, all the incentives they would have not to get into a further conflict with us. A lot of those were removed when we pulled out of that deal. So yeah, I don't think the problem was that we, that we entered into the deal. I think the problem was we pulled out of it. And uh, it strikes me, it's quite interesting that uh, on the very day after we have uh, started these airstrikes on uh, targeted places in Yemen, Rishi Sunak is actually in Kiev meeting Volodymyr uh, Zelensky and pledging to boost support by £2.5 billion a year. Uh, in America, there's been a big debate over whether supporting Ukraine is a, a good idea or not. Can you explain, perhaps, if these the events we're seeing unfolding right now, what's going on in the Red Sea and what is also going on with Russia and Ukraine are related? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I think what you're seeing in the United States Congress now is a lot of reluctance to continue to fund a war in Ukraine. They're asking for $45 billion, the Biden administration is. That, that's an enormous amount of money for us right now in a, in a tight budgetary environment. So I think you're getting a lot of congressmen, senators on the Democratic side and the Republican side who are asking, what's that money going for? If it's a stalemate in Ukraine, regardless of what we do, why are we giving them $45 more billion? Right now, the Biden administration remains very committed to trying to get that aid to President Zelensky and the Ukrainians. It's tied up now in a, in a very tricky debate about immigration and border security here in the United States. So that it remains to be seen whether that will get resolved or not. My, my sense is that there will be a way forward uh, on at least some Ukrainian aid, because I think the Biden administration is really committed on that. Uh, so we are, Frank, uh, please. And uh, let's bring uh, Jerome uh, Starkey from The Sun back in. Uh, Jerome, I mean, people here in Britain uh, want to know how this will affect them or might affect them. First of all, I mean, I, in my uh, world of ignorance, can assure everyone this is going to hit you in the pocket. This is going to get expensive uh, because goods are going to cost a lot more to ferry around the world because they can't go through that all-important artery, the Suez Canal, at the moment. So that much we know. Uh, but uh, what about terrorism? You, you talked about, uh, you know, the Houthis will respond by attacking for more cargo ships. I mean, frankly, if you're a cargo ship right now and you want to go through the Red Sea, it strikes me you need your head examining. But if they do that, they will attack. Uh, but what about the potential uh, for Houthi-inspired terrorism in Britain and America and the West? Well, Kevin, it's a really good question. It's not just Houthi-inspired terrorism, but I think, uh, you know, perhaps extremist and particularly Islamist extremist terrorism writ large uh, the risk from that, I know from speaking to very senior security sources here in the UK, they are concerned that the risk, particularly of the sort of lone wolf attacks, the people who might self-radicalise yeah. in their bedrooms, has increased. And that's increased not just because of what's happening in Yemen, but that's also increased dramatically because of what's been happening in the Gaza Strip as well. Uh, you know, and clearly, um, you know, that the conflict in Israel uh, evokes very, very strong uh, feelings on both sides. Uh, and, and there is a sense that, uh, you know, there's concern that people who are unhappy, not just with what Israel's been doing, but unhappy with the way this government and Western governments have been backing Israel to do it, that they may take matters into their own hands. So that's a real concern. Yes. Frank, I want to go back to you and pick, pick up on something that you uh, spoke about earlier when we were talking about aid to Ukraine and you said it's becoming a big debate in America where allocation of resources should go. And on one hand, you mentioned um, the illegal waves of uh, so-called migrants entering the United States. And this is something that, of course, has captivated attention here in the UK as well. Uh, how much do you think that some of these illegal waves are also being created by hostile states as an act of grey zone warfare? That's a hard question to answer. I, I think you'd have to go down to the border and, and really assess who is coming across there. But it almost doesn't matter for the United States perspective. We have a massive problem on the border and it's become an issue for both Democrats and Republicans. It used to be a Trump thing. We're going to build a wall on Democrats so didn't see that we had that big of a problem. But now everybody's in agreement that there's a massive issue there. And I think that there is a way forward that will include Democrats moving towards Republicans on border security. And in return for that, uh, Republicans approving some degree of aid for Ukraine. I don't know if it'll be $45 billion, but I, I do see there's a path forward there. Can I ask you the same question that I just asked Jerome, Frank? Uh, 
the, the threat, the fear uh, that there may be terrorist attacks on both America and Britain, in your uh, perspective, how serious is that? Yeah, I agree with Jerome completely on that. I don't think the Houthis have any kind of international reach. I don't think they'll be sponsoring any terrorist attacks in the United States directly. The question is, you know, whether Iran has that type of capability and whether they'd like to deploy that. My, my guess is they don't, and they wouldn't anyway. But the lone wolf problem is a very serious one, and there's really no defense to that. And I think, as, as Jerome said, they've really been radicalized much more by Gaza than any sort of sympathy for the Houthis. But I think that's something that we've got to be on high alert for. And it's something that the American public needs to understand as we continue down this path, that, that there is risk that this is going to come home to the United States. Yeah, Jerome, politically, Rishi Sunak uh, uh, instigating the intervention uh, without any recourse to Parliament. It's a case that I'm backing him. Uh, obviously, that would have come from multilateral intelligence sources and tacit approval, essentially, from the UN as well. But there have already been voices of dissent within the Labour Party and with the Liberal Democrats. Uh, if that picks up, if, if people start politically opposing any sort of action by the United Kingdom in the Middle East, how much is that going to harm us and how much does that play into the hands of uh, people like Iran? Well, I think in, in Rishi Sunak's defence on this, you know, wars don't always unfold to the, you know, in tandem with the schedules of Parliament. Uh, and, and he was, uh, he couldn't recall Parliament because he was due to be in Kyiv today, as we've seen. Uh, and, you know, crucially also, he's, he has the authority, the prerogative to launch these, this kind of action. He hasn't put British, uh, he's put British uh, personnel in harm's way because the airmen on board those aircraft were putting themselves in danger. The people on board, the sailors on board the warships are in harm's way. But he wasn't putting, in that sense, boots on the ground. This wasn't a, a land invasion. And there will be opportunities, I think, for Parliament to debate it later. In terms of how does this help Iran or hinder the UK, I suppose it's worth going back to when David Cameron lost the vote in Parliament for uh, greater interventions in Syria. And, and what was really behind that probably was a sort of weariness among MPs and indeed possibly amongst the British public for long, costly uh, interventions, you know, wars of choice, or the wars of choice that the UK had found itself fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they didn't Parliament, I think possibly reflecting in many ways a lot of public opinion, did not want to see British, British forces overcommitted in Syria. Now, I'm not suggesting that is the case now. I think there appears to be widespread support on the whole for what's happened. The dissent that we've heard really appears to be procedural. Uh, and, you know, so, some MPs, perhaps for political reasons, you know, complaining that they weren't consulted in advance. Um, but as I say, this isn't a declaration of war. Britain has not gone to war with Yemen or gone to war with the Houthis. Uh, this is being framed as a limited, targeted act of self-defence. And so, you know, so for that reason, uh, I think it's you know, well within uh, sort of protocol and prerogative uh, what the Prime Minister has done. Uh, let's go back to uh, Frank. I, I mean, you know, in my unfeasibly long life, uh, you know, I've been around a few years, uh, I've never known uh, this kind of international mosaic of tension to be at a more critical level. It is no exaggeration to say that unless we are careful, this could escalate into a global conflict, World War III. What can America and Britain do to prevent that? What should we be doing uh, to keep a lid on this? Well, I think that you have to go to the sponsors of the of the terrorists. Obviously, Iran is, is, is where that begins. But because we don't engage directly with Iran and have a limited amount of leverage with them, I think we have to engage to a degree with the Russians and the Chinese who are providing a lot of uh, support for Iran and basically make the case to them uh, that this kind of global war doesn't serve their interests, it doesn't serve our interests. So they need to work on their end to control the actors that they have some influence over, particularly Iran. So, yeah, I think that the notion that there's going to be a, a global war uh, uh, is, is a sort of questionable one in the sense that I think there's already an escalatory pattern here in Iraq and Syria and Yemen, but I don't see how that expands into a broader regional war unless perhaps the Saudis go back into Yemen to try to fight Houthis or something like that. As so before, I think the, the real risk here for the United States is that Lebanon uh, uh, will blow up and that Iran will, will somehow or other trigger Hezbollah. And from everything we've heard right now, Hezbollah doesn't want that war and Iran doesn't want that war. So my sense is that you're going to see flare-ups around the region. The Houthis will respond, the Iranians will respond with their militias, where we think the United States is vulnerable. But I don't see a lot of risk that it's going to blow up into a war outside of Israel and Lebanon. Uh, and Jerome, uh, finally, 
Talking about there being military flare-ups and these flashpoints that we're seeing around the world, it strikes me that perhaps this is more like a Cold War scenario where an end game, let's say, for hostile states such as China, such as Russia, with their connections to Iran, is wanting to see the economic degradation of the United Kingdom and a destabilization of the West rather than a direct arms conflict where perhaps we might still have the upper hand. I think comparisons with the Cold War, uh, you know, certainly true in terms of great power struggles, but I think the powers involved are different. And I think we might flatter ourselves to say that the degradation of the United Kingdom is, is perhaps uh, an objective, uh, you know, it, perhaps the European or the West uh, writ large. Um, but with the powers involved, it's no longer, you know, America versus Russia. And that appears to be playing out to some extent uh, in Ukraine. But you know, the, the changing dynamic now is that obviously uh, you've got the, the rise of or the risen Saudi Arabia, uh, its confrontation with Iran. You've got, you know, the rise of China or the risen China and its sort of looming confrontation but, uh, with America over what happens in Taiwan. Uh, thank you, Jerome. And uh, thank you, Frank Lowenstein. Jerome Starkey from The Sun there. Great to talk to you.